Hey everybody, here we are, rounding third. Dad, you ready for the story of the day? Yeah, we'll try. Great we'll try stories it. are fun, so buckle in everybody, enjoy. Today, I really have an honor to present to you the story of Josh Gibson. Uh, Josh Gibson is one of the greatest baseball players who ever played, and I just decided I wanted to tell his story. But when I started looking it up, this is actually a really hard story to tell. So let me explain why and I'll do the best I can. In 1890, the baseball owners entered into something which historically has been called a gentleman's agreement, which said, we won't hire any black players. It wasn't against the law, it's just we won't do it because we have a bunch of ball players who don't want to play on the same team with blacks and so we're just not going to push that envelope and probably if we hire blacks fans won't come to the games and if um if baseball is a reflection of american history at the time this is a reflection of a very very ugly time so many talented athletes never got a chance to enter into baseball history because of the color of their skin. And that went on from 1890 to 1947 when Jackie Robinson took the field for the Brooklyn Dodgers. And all those players in between, nothing. Universally, they say the best players in those leagues were Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson. The problem is baseball lives on statistics and the statistics of these men, and this is what made this so difficult, are there's just not much. We have statistics for what we call the Negro Leagues, which Josh Gibson played in. Do you know those leagues only played 30 and 40 game seasons? So how many home runs can you hit in a 30 game season? The reason they did that is these players made more money barnstorming around the country on pickup teams and getting paid per game than they did playing in the leagues. So they kept the season short so they could go out and make money. And if a man was a good baseball player, he played 12 months of the year. So I want to talk about Josh Gibson, who just universally is declared the greatest hitter people ever saw. But we, we, we can't really get our hands around that because a lot of Josh's accomplishments were played against really inferior teams. I mean, he would play against, he'd be on teams that would play against semi-pro teams and things like that. So when they talk about all these home runs, Barry Bonds said that Josh Gibson hit 800 home runs. No one really knows how many he hit, except he hit a lot of them. But maybe two-thirds of them were against really, really inferior teams. So it's, it was really hard for me to figure out how great Josh was. Um, he's a man like Paul Bunyan. The stories about him are impossible to be true, but they go around. Let me read this one. There's a story. I'm just going to read it from the book. During the 1930s, when he was playing for the Pittsburgh Crawfords, they were playing in Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, Josh Gibson hit a ball so high and far, no one saw it come down. (laughs) After scanning the sky for a few minutes, the umpire deliberated and ruled it a home run. The next day, the Crawfords were playing in Philadelphia. They traveled from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia. When suddenly a ball dropped out of the heavens (laughs) and was caught by a startled center fielder on the opposing team. The umpire made the only possible ruling. Pointing to Gibson, he shouted, you're out in yesterday's game. (laughs) So when you have stories like that going around, you just say, "What, what is the deal? Here's some things we know. Josh Gibson was born in Georgia. His family moved to Pittsburgh, where his father worked in a factory. Uh, Josh was working manual labors when they found out that he could really play baseball. So he played and he was really good. And at a young age, in his teenage years, he was getting paid to play baseball by semi-pro teams. 
Uh, there was a time when the Pittsburgh uh, Crawfords were just a semi-pro team, and uh, but they had some good players. And he would, from time to time, play against really good players and some bad players. But they said that he could just hit the bejeepers out of a baseball. I mean, um, then the story started coming about, like, in, in, in the Negro Leagues, I think they have him down for 166 home runs. But he, he didn't play many games. This is his whole career. Because all his games, I mean, he played on these barnstorming teams. He played in Mexico. He played in Puerto Rico. He played in, uh, uh, what was the other country? Dominican Republic. He, all year long, all he did was play baseball. And although they recognized him as the greatest hitter, another phenomenon happened is he didn't draw the crowds that Satchel did. Satchel would pitch in thousands of people because Satchel was a showman. You know, Satchel would tell infielders to all go and sit in a dugout because he's going to strike that eye out. Um, but Josh just played the game and he didn't do these fancy things. But everyone who saw him play and played with him said that his power was amazing. And when he hit the ball, it just made such a tremendous noise. One of the players there, um, I, I don't remember his Buck Leonard, but a guy who was highly respected, said he had a ball and it was like an explosion. And in his whole life, he only heard that noise two other times. Once he watched Babe Ruth and he heard that same noise once. Third one's going to surprise you. He said he heard that third noise another time off the bat of Bone Jackson. So it was interesting how he put those people together. Josh not a big guy. He was short. He was not six feet tall. He weighed about 205. He played catcher. The stories about his catching go back and forth. There's a whole section that said he wasn't very good at catching. And then a whole other section was that was at the beginning. He really learned how to catch and he could really catch well, throw people out, and he was a good defensive player. But that's not what he was known for. He was just, uh, just, just a couple of stories. Again, we don't know if these stories are true. That That's what makes it so hard to do. Um, here's one. He once said uh, he was playing a Negro League game in Yankee Stadium, and he hit a ball so far it struck two feet from the top wall, circling the center field bleachers. Would have measured about five hundred and eighty feet from home plate. Chicago American Giants infielder Jack Marshall said Gibson slugged one over the third deck next to the left field bullpen in thirty four for the only fair ball ever hit out of Yankee Stadium. And again, that was one guy saying that. The owner of the Washington Senators would go and watch Josh bat and play when his team was on the road. And he once said that Gibson hit more home runs. They would play in his stadium, Griffith Stadium in Washington. He said Gibson hit more home runs into Griffith Stadium's distant left field bleachers then the entire American League hit the whole season long. That's how often and far he could hit him. So one thing we know for sure, the people who watched him, the people who played with him, were just amazed. Uh, sad story. Josh Gibson got sick. He, he had an alcohol problem. Josh Gibson was an alcoholic. Although all the people that tell the story said they never really saw him intoxicated. He just drank a lot, but um, it took its toll. And as a young man, he had a stroke and uh, he was, I think, in his early 40s. He wasn't very old. He had a stroke and ended up dying. The sad story is it was only a few days after he died that Jackie Robinson took the field. So he never saw a black player in the major leagues. All the people who played with him, I mean, universally, they would say, I just read this one this morning. Uh, one of the guys that played in, in the Negro Leagues, he said, here's the truth. Jackie wasn't the best player in the Negro Leagues. Not even close. He said, Josh Gibson, Satchel Paige, they, and other ones. But he said, they were better than Jackie Robinson. It's just the timing of it. He never got an opportunity to show his gifts and talents. So we live with a legend. 
which has some facts to it, but um, a lot of myth mixed in. We know this. He played 12 months of the year. He made more money playing baseball than he could have ever made working in the factories, but less money than the baseball stars. He actually made pretty good money, but not as much as, say, DiMaggio and the stars of the American leagues did. You know, and he suffered from all the other things that these players suffered from. Travel and inferior transportation from city to city, staying in hotels that the only hotels that would allow blacks to stay in them, which were really inferior, eating crappy food, uh, and just every day just doing that over and over again. But he loved to play the game, as most of those stars did. And he, you know, he made money for his family. Uh, he, his wife um, died at a young age, giving birth to twins. And he was supporting his kids with the money he made. So it was a... Uh, it was an interesting thing. He became the first black manager uh, in the, uh, I think it was the, uh, yeah, the Puerto Rican League. So when he played like in Mexico and Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic, um, it, the, the Latin black players, white players all played together down there and they made managers of them and it was just no big deal to go and play there. And they, they would do that in the winters and then come back and try to make money touring around. Uh, and, uh, you know, they played in northern cities for the most part because the southern cities wouldn't. The, the 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 thing about the southern cities, if you went to the black sections of town, they would draw big crowds, but otherwise people wouldn't. And there was this built-in prejudice that no matter how good those black players were, they weren't ever as good as the white guys. But there's no evidence to support that. As time went on, blacks and whites did play uh, practice games, oftentimes in California in the winter. Bob Feller set up games. Uh, Satchel Page would play. Dizzy Dean would play. And they said the best black players were every bit as good as the white players. There was no difference in the stars. So we have to believe what people said about Josh Gibson. I will close with two people that are believable. Larry Doby was the first black player in American League, played for the Indians. And he said, basically, I told you this, but this was his quote. One of the things that was disappointing and uh, disheartening to a lot of the black players at the time was Jackie was not the best player. The best was Josh Gibson. I think that's one of the reasons why died, Josh died so early. He was heartbroken. And finally, I will use a quote from the really well-respected white Hall of Fame pitcher, Walter Johnson. Now, Walter Johnson's a whole other story, but his records are magnificent. 410 career wins, 110 shutouts. Think about that. Walter Johnson was called the big train, and he, was, he also became a manager, very well-respected. And one day he said it. There is a catcher that any big league club would like to buy for $200,000. His name is Gibson. He can do everything. He hits the ball a mile, and he catches so easy, he might as well be in a rocking chair. Throws like a rifle. Bill Dickey isn't as good as this catcher. Too bad this Gibson is a colored fellow. And that describes the tragedy of segregation in our country as typified in baseball. But I think they they rightly put Josh Gibson in the Hall of Fame. And they also made a rule that said all the uh, records from the Negro Leagues will be added to their records in the Hall of Fame. But again, there just weren't a lot of games for us to refer to. So we'll go back to Barry Bonds. And there's the possibility that Josh Gibson did hit between 800 and 1,000 home runs, regardless of the competition. And that's a lot of time circling the bases. He was a terrific player, great athlete. And I take our hat off today to Josh. In 1943, he hit more home runs over left and center field in Griffiths Park than the entire American League. Yeah, that's what they said. Yeah, that's absolutely true. That, I mean, um, and they, they got records of some years, him in 69 home runs, 70 home runs. Yeah. 
It's um, well, I, I mean, it's also borderline, yeah, believable. But yeah, can you see his batting averages? Um, many many years batting over four hundred. Oh yeah, yeah. High three hundreds, four hundreds. So it wasn't just home runs. The guy could just rake. I mean, right. For the story of hitting the ball in Pittsburgh and it coming down in Philadelphia. <laughs> That's pretty That's fun. when I thought I was reading about Paul Bunyan. It's absolutely. And it's so hard to try, to try to speculate, like, when do these guys, you know, how do you compare them to players in their in their own era? And like you said, like, it's hard because the competition wasn't the same. Competition wasn't, you know, it wasn't even fairly comparable or or, or that type of thing. But at the same time, if you're batting against Satchel Page or, or you know, you're, you know, some of these guys, it's, you, you got to give credit to that stuff. Well, you have to listen to the people who played with him, who actually went to the major leagues, like Larry Doby. He went to the major leagues, he played in the black leagues, and he tell you, this, this guy was the best hitter I've ever seen. Right. Plain and simple. So uh, when Walter Johnson, who was before Jackie Robinson by many years, he never saw black players in the majors. When he said, this is the best catcher in America, then you have to say he, he was really good. Yeah. The other thing that I liked the most about this story is that I, I trust the year. Who was the individual that said there's three people who hit the ball? Like the ball came off the bat. You know, I, I'm trying to remember that if it was, uh, I read it and then I forgot to write it down. It was either Buck O'Neill or Buck so Leonard, one of those. When you talk about Bo Jackson, and Bo Jackson is well documented as a young man, the Yankees wanted him really bad. So they brought out a scout. And this is a story that's been well documented. A scout to watch him do batting practice in the batting cage. He was hitting the ball so hard in the batting cages, he knocked the netting, the interior netting that they string up for batting cage. He knocked it all down. Mm -hmm. He destroyed it doing the BP for these uh, major league scouts. And the Yankees immediately offered him a deal to which his mother said, we won't be bought out by the Yankees. So he went off in college and his biggest, his biggest uh, deal going to college was he wanted to play two sports. He would not play for a team that only wanted him to do football and not play baseball. He wanted to play both sports. When you hear again, and you go back and listen to when Bo Jackson hits it, you're talking about a guy. This is the other thing that's really hard for people to understand. When you watch baseball today, it is a new baseball whenever they want, all the time. There is no scuff. There is no rough. There is nothing. These baseballs that these pitchers use, it was one baseball, and there was no trading it out. There was not, a, there was not oh, I don't like the way this one feels. Let me give it back to you. So if he's hitting the balls that are, again, to me, have some dirt, some scuff, these guys, the pitchers were doing everything they can to get the advantage on the hitter. I mean, you're scuffing it. Everything. The spitball was spitball everything. was legal. They, and you're talking about balls. a league that would do everything they can to get these guys out. So think about the crack of the bat, the listening of the crack. And again, another thing that's really hard for people today, take away the distractions, the music, the sound effects, the wave machine, the this, the that. You went to baseball and you could have a conversation and be heard, but it was the crack of the bat when it got when you jumped on that baseball and again, traveling 12 months out of the year, there was not a, probably a soul who didn't want him to play. Everybody wanted him to play and see him play, whether it's, you know, in right. Mexico, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic. But to your point about uh, the theft, and it really is a theft. It's not only a theft to Americans as a whole, but a theft to culture. The fact that these were not blended and looked at with the blending of the culture it erased a lot of the idea of that this is a different tiered system. And I think in a way, when you look at uh, sports today, you know, it's whoever is the best gets to move up. And again, you got to play the game and follow the rules and what have you. But you're not only were robbed by the robbed by the greatness of watching him play against some some really great talent, but I think the talent in the Major League Baseball was scared to incorporate that because they were worried about losing their spots as well. So there was a lot of that secret signatures. We don't want this. We don't want to promote this. We don't want to lose. You know, the white players were scared of the integration as well. So if you have that kind of talent rising up, and again, Jackie Robinson clearly, and I love what baseball does now, retiring his number everywhere. They have Jackie Robinson Day, which is fantastic. But I think 
it would be great to me to have a month celebrating these players where you can have a Jackie Robinson yeah. day, a Josh Gibson day, a Sassel. If you oh, did yeah. that, so everyone knows Jackie Robinson. They made a movie about him. There's so many players in this rich history. And any announcer or anybody who goes to the museum, they literally leave in awe of what these players were able to do. So if you had a team, each team could pick a player for that day, and you did a month of this or even a series of it. It would be so great for Major League Baseball to not only bring awareness to these great players, but to have that story. I mean, the fact that you can have these stories that are almost biblical in nature, like Noah's Ark, per se, or like uh, David Goliath's, per se. So you have these stories that are like the the fireball coming down in Philadelphia the next day. You bring up these conversations, these quotes. You cover it in the paper, the bullet. The, I mean, what is it? The uh, not the 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 program, the baseball program can talk about these players. You can hand them out and say, "This is who we're celebrating today." This is what, in my opinion, should not only be happening, but it should be followed up. Jackie Robinson led to these other players getting into Major League Baseball. However, it's the players who never got the chance. And sadly, to your point, he died at the age of 35, which is extremely young, no doubt about it. The other thing... You'd have got a 10-year contract yeah. today. Thir- at, at age 35. Now? Absolutely. Um, especially if you see Nelson Cruz play. It's If you... Right. If you're looking at this and you're saying, and the other thing that's really hard, again, you got no airplanes. Everyone's doing bus travel. You get in late. You're at the ballpark. You know, this is is a recipe for not taking care of yourself. There's nobody that, you know, he's, it wasn't like having four, three good meals a day. Uh, you get in late, you know, it's just the nature of baseball. But I would... I again, please comment. I think it would be great to start a movement to celebrate these players after Jackie Robinson, not just because Jackie Robinson broke in to baseball, which he clearly did, and he, that was fantastic. We should be celebrating the players that never got that chance. Hey, um, Dad, you said you had some books that you recommended or that you had read about Josh Gibson. Do you have any recommendation recommendations on that? The one I refer to the most, I have in my hand here, written by Robert Peterson, is called Only the Ball Was White. And it was all about the great Negro players and stuff like that. You know, I've already talked about two. We talked about Moses Fleet Walker. We talked about Cool Papa Bell. And now we talked about Josh. You can count in the future. I'm going to be bringing up these guys, Satchel Page for sure. Um, and I'm sure by and I'm sure by the way we get like some links to those other episodes too. Yeah. So I just I just think that if you care about baseball but you've never heard of this, you really should learn about this because that was baseball that wasn't allowed to be seen. And we should know about it because yeah. um these these were amazing athletes that never got their opportunity. But we should remember we put them in the Hall of Fame finally. But we shouldn't we shouldn't forget them or know not know they ever existed, right? And the and the other thing that's right. great even about having that league back then because again they they had no option, there was no option of where they could go and play baseball, so the fact that they you know, again had the league for the competition so you can remember these great players because they were great and they were great in their own right, and so bringing more awareness to this and and for those that haven't been to the museum. Um, all I've heard is fantastic things. Dad, I believe you've been, if I remember correctly, to the uh to the um to the museum. Not not Okay. And that's from New York. All right, so yes, yeah, so that's if you're in and I would love to Kansas go. City, to if go. you're in Kansas City, that should be a must. I would I mean again, I think that this is something that baseball should not only promote but uh be advertising and uh because you you hear about all the play, I mean the Babe Ruths, the Ty Cobbs, all the players that played in the uh, when the segregated baseball. So you know about those folks, and you just don't have a lot of uh, vis- visuals on these folks. And they they again they they broke it, they broke in, they played just as great a baseball. If they played a different style of baseball, for instance, or they weren't as remembered or as good, they, they we wouldn't they we, we there would never been a push for this. It's because people went out there and saw the talent. And said this is this would only add value to the game as a whole, 
And again, the owners want to win, so that was probably the other thing is we can do this and then we can possibly win championships in this with this kind of uh, talent. So again, the competition, sh- sh- shockingly, did you shockingly, sh- that didn't click into the owners until 1950s when they started bringing in these guys and they started winning with them and they said, whoa, what were we thinking? <laughs> yeah. Did you, did you see his... Um... Stats in the Mexican League? I think so, but go ahead and tell us. Like, so 116 games in two seasons, right? So 116 games, yeah, 450 at bats, right? So not a like not a standard current season, but 116 games, 450 at bats. He had 44 home runs, 38 doubles, 162 ribbies, 91 walks. 31 strikeouts. Wow. Does this show his batting average? Um, batting average was 393 with an on-base percentage of 496. Well, think about this. That's about, what, two-thirds of a season? Or maybe that was his slugging percentage. To a two-thirds of a season, he had 160 RBIs already? Right. 160. Well, no, no, no. His on-base percentage was 492. His slugging was 802. So he would have comfortably hit 70 home runs and driven in 200 and some runs. At 44 home runs, you figure he's got another 50 games left. Yeah. Right? That, I mean, that's Bonds level 2003, and 2004. The thing is, with, when you're with inferior talent like you are today in AAA or AA baseball, they immediately bring you up. If you're playing this good, you're immediately brought up because you got... Unless you're the Mets and you got guys that are raking and, you know, you just like watching, staring at Vogel snacks, sitting there doing nothing. Yeah, you, you totally you should put a little asterisk when you talk about this. Uh, there's somebody. At the time of this recording, uh, the Mets are still suppressing Vientos into now, and, uh, Mauricio and the minor league. The minor league is more entertaining. But, you know, the Mets know what's up. They know where they make their money. Um, Listen, if the if Josh Gibson... The there, and then the story is like hitting the uh, the third level in Yankee Stadium, in the old like Yankee Stadium, right in left yeah. field, not the cheap like right field, right that was like a little league fence. He, he turned on it and he got all of it. Well, the word is no one ever hit a ball out of Yankee Stadium, but there are a lot of people who claim Josh I would, did. So Mantle, no, they claim Mantle did. Josh. Josh. Babe Ruth, Mantle, and that was a hard, that's a long stadium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mike Francesa, I think, uh, claims a lot of things about Mantle. No one loves Mantle like Mike Francesa. I think he, he um, when he was a kid, he said he saw Mantle hit one. Maybe that was in BP or something like that. But Mantle was, Mantle had it. You far, imagine, jo- can you imagine the Josh stuff, Gibson? The stuff can you imagine Gibson? BP? Oh, would you oh, just gosh. love to, love to go watch him in BP in these stadiums? Anyway, so if MLB the show does it right, they'd have these players in there too. Do they really? I think they do. I want to I talk. You want to talk? I, I think they do. In a long time, but that would be fantastic so, if they had. Uh, they were you were able to play with Josh Gibson and Satchel Page. So we talk about how some players enhance their performance with PEDs. Josh's PED was booze. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. The show twenty three. Uh, features eight of the greatest Negro League players, Satchel Paige, Jackie Robinson, Buck O'Neill, Rube Foster, Hilton Smith, Hank Thompson, John Donaldson, and Martin Digo in a new game called Storylines do, does not feature Bob Gibson. Josh. Doesn't Josh Josh Gibson? Does not feature Josh Gibson. Shame. Huge mistake. Well, Absolute sham. That's why you listen. That's why you listen to us. We, get we tell you who's facts. bad yeah. before they're bad, and we tell you who's great and wasn't remembered. <laughs> That's terrible. Josh Gibson should yeah. be in the home run derby in the MLB show. Did they? Oh, did, did they have should right. Papa Bell? Nope. Well, and a cool Papa Bell was a runner. He was great at stealing bases, but boy, he was fun to watch. I'm told. <laughs> Apparently, apparently, there's a beef between the NL uh, BM and the Gibson family over licensing. You know, how you get over that. You pay them tons of money. Yeah, seriously. Like, 
Because I, you're not going to pick yeah, the kitchen like, family. Give name a stadium after them and give them naming rights. Give them part of a team for goodness sakes. Oh, I can't come to terms with one of the best players in the history of the game because their family's being difficult. Uh, back a truck up to their driveway. Bring out gold, <laughs> gold bars and Bitcoin, and say thank you very much. Would you like some more? That same network pays their announcers who never played the game millions of dollars. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? That's the other thing. If you're an announcer for the MLB, the show, why wouldn't you take a stand and say, no, 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 I'm not doing this until you get Josh Gibson on this thing. Make it right. Come on. And you know what it is? It's a bunch of lawyers. It's the lawyers. Go back to the real. The re- it's still you know lawyers. What, you know what they do? They do. They do with these games is they'll make uh, they'll make the player pay to play. Right. Yeah, you, get, you know, buy some of the uh, MLB The Show tokens with this fake currency, and you can buy the Josh Gibson power up. The thing. Josh Gibson arms, you just get his arms. Yeah. <laughs> no, today, I... who's the who's that guy in South America that pumps the fluid into his his guns? And he's all he's all yeah, juiced he up. Will die before thirty five. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What about do swing batter. All right, folks, ladies and gentlemen, Dad, that was a fantastic story. I am not only uplifted, but more educated, as they would say. And I, again, please leave a comment. Tell us how we can get uh, more of these more of these heroes, more of these icons remembered by MLB. MLB should do a better job with this. They're, they need to do more than just Jackie Robinson. I say, I say, I say, we need to do more. We celebrate all sorts of junk nowadays at these baseball games. You mean to tell me we can't have a, a weekend series where players can remember their favorite? And some of these folks, I mean, again, I I promote it. I want it. Give me more of it. Thanks for the story, Father. Do, Closing thoughts? Do it up. Do it up. I think it's a great idea. Like, uh, you just have a weekend where, you know, every city, you know, you, you, you grab one of the one of these players that historically has just been... Yeah, just like kind of forgotten the history. Um, well, you could become like up. an you could become like an evangelist and wear a Pittsburgh Crawford's T-shirt. And when a guy says to you, "What is that?" It says, "I am glad you asked. I want to talk to you about Josh Gibson." Have you heard this? Have I? Have you heard about Josh Gibson and the impact he can have on your life? If you can do all these city league jerseys that are absolute garbage in some instances, in some instances they're good. But, I mean, again, if you're going to have the Padres city league jersey, you can't do this, Major League Baseball? Figure it out. I am your host, Brendan. That is Dad. That is Todd. That is your story. Josh Gibson is the man, the myth, and the legend. That's Swing Batter rounding third. Thank you, Batter Sports.